Um, the following video is a presentation of the Marine Corps uh, Vietnam Tankers Association History Project. What we're trying to do at the reunion here in Washington, D.C., October 30th, 2015, is capture the stories and experiences of many of the, uh, of the members of our association from their Vietnam experiences. And this particular group, and they'll introduce themselves in a second, um, the title of our particular video is going to be 30 Days a Grunt. And I'll turn it over to the gentleman to my immediate left. I'm uh, John Heffernan. I uh, was Alpha 3 and Alpha 5 in uh, 3rd Tank Battalion from uh, September of 1968 until, I'm sorry, from uh, May of 1969 until September of 1969. My name is uh, Bob Skeels, and uh, upon arrival in Vietnam, yeah, September 28th, 1968, uh, I was assigned, well, I was, we were all thrown a curveball <laughs> and I was assigned to infantry outfits. So I was assigned to 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines. So I, uh, uh, the very next day, I uh, was choppered into um, uh, uh, LZ Stud or Combat Base uh, Vandegriff, and uh, then out to my my platoon was uh, third platoon, uh, Echo Company, second battalion, fourth Marines, and I served uh, 90 days in the uh, with them before being reassigned to my tank MOS 1802 with Bravo Company, third tank battalion, third Marine division, as uh, first platoon commander, first platoon leader, uh, uh, Bravo Company, third tanks. Great, and I didn't follow my own instructions. I'm Pete Rich. I was with. Um, went to Vietnam in September of 1968. Um, I think about the same time you guys I went in the country. The plane. Yeah, we were on the same plane, I think. Uh, <laughs> went over the global route, which took us in our, uh, our khaki uniforms to Alaska, where we got out and went across the runway in the snow and ice uh, in our summer, summer tans, or whatever we call them in those days. Um, when we got to country, a little bit of background, when we got to country, we flew into Da Nang, the, uh, the standing order for the 3rd Marine Division was that if you were a new lieutenant in country, you spent your first 90 days in country as an infantry platoon commander, uh, which scared the life out of me because I flunked map reading in, B in TBS and had to take remedial map reading, and suddenly they told me I was going to be on the ground, boots on the ground with a map with uh, 27 of my best friends. So to say nothing, uh, as Bob said, it was a bit of a culture shock to find out all this track vehicle education we got was not going to be used for at least 90 days. And I think Hef had even a little longer experience. Yeah, the, uh, the premise was, and General Davis set it up, was that you, if you weren't uh, infantry or artillery, you went to the infantry for, for 90 days. The, the issue was if you were any good at it or if they just needed you, they kept you. <laughs> if you were bad at it, you know, they told you, well, you get a job counting jock straps in the rear. Huh. <laughs> uh, so the outfit that I was in, Charlie Company 1-3, was um, pretty uh, under strength, and the whole battalion was pretty under strength. And our CO, uh, Lieutenant Colonel R.B. Tui, uh, didn't believe in coming to the rear. Uh, we came to the rear once on the 14th of December, in 1968, and the next time I saw the rear was when I got medevaced uh, to the hospital ship on uh, May the 13th, or March the 13th, I'm sorry. Bob yeah, um, yeah, I think when we got assigned uh, our temporary active duty, uh, yeah, my, my, I could feel my spine stiffen, and I could hear, I think the three of us, four of us, I think there was four of us in the lineup, you could hear people swallow hard, <laughs> so it was kind of a kind of a shock. But all of a sudden, you had to ready yourself for, you know, frontline infantry. And uh, I think one of the reasons was is that there in 1968, the worst year in Vietnam, and uh, peak Marine strength was in June of 68, 396,000 Marines in country. But anyways, the, the chance to uh, send the chance uh, of an infantry officer being killed was 85 percent so they had no infantry officers left so the uh, 
like John said, uh, Colonel uh, General Davis, uh, that was his program to assign any MOS uh, other than artillery, frontline artillery, to uh, 90 days in infantry. But the grunts didn't like it when a green lieutenant showing up to a frontline grunt unit, some of them on second tours. Uh, I, I had heard that they didn't like it at all. Uh, a green armor tank lieutenant uh, <laughs> leading them frontline infantry in Vietnam. Uh, the main reason they didn't like it is just at the time it, where you, you were getting to get experience and be an experienced grunt lieutenant, you were leaving them. So they didn't like that at all. But uh, um, when I first arrived, I, on, I think it was eight, Hill 8, 861 in, in Quezon, I had a, pulled the squad leaders together and had a meeting and they, uh, I asked for anyone that had second tours and I told them that would be, uh, you know, pulling together a lot of their experience and making any decision. I said the word uh, charge is not in my vocabulary <laughs> <laughs> and that I would wipe it clean and make sure no frontal assaults. And so, but it was an experience, it was a, a great experience. I think it prepared me uh, very well. And I, I think I was able to serve as a tank lieutenant with the, working alongside Marine Infantry and, and Arvin Infantry much better had I not spent 90 days with uh, frontline infantry. One of the things that is different in my case is that um, unlike John and, and Bob, who remember the units they were in and where they were and the fire bases names and all those other things, I think I had selective memory. I think I erased my whole grunt experience. Um, but I remember very similar to, to these guys being, uh, I think I ended up from Da Nang to Dong Ha to, I think it was Stud at the time, um, but uh, Vanegra and then assigned to an infantry platoon, choppered out to a fire support base and spent the next at least 45 days in the monsoon season on this hilltop that was somewhere very close to Laos. Um, the artillery could not shoot north or west, so that gives you an idea that we, we were near the DMZ in Laos on those two sides. And so most of their um, artillery rounds were going east and south. And we would do patrols out off that fire support base uh, every day and just go down in the valley and check that out and then come back and get into our um, water soaked foxholes and under our uh, uh, the tent, I forget what they called them, but the, the, we had some that we'd pull over us and it wasn't quite a tent, but it was a poncho, poncho. yeah, what under point? our ponchos and just then be up all night on guard duty on two hour shifts. So. Um, then I had a couple of other stints with other units, but again, I just don't remember the units. I've, I've gone, I've got, I need to go back and find the, my records because um, those units I, I was assigned to are somewhere out there, but they weren't on my DD-214 or anything like that. But I was fortunate in 90 days to the day, um, I was sent back to the tank battalion where I really, when I arrived, Bravo Company 3rd Tanks at Vindai on Route 9 up in uh, i -Corps. Uh, I kissed the gun barrel of the first tank I saw because I was so happy to finally stay dry, stay relatively warm, kind of in a tight fit when you're in the turret with, all, with three other guys or two other guys, uh, but it was much better than trekking around in the mud and the swamps and the monsoons and the yeah. dust and all that other good stuff that these guys did probably much more frequently than I did. But it was, uh, it was a good experience. I had a tremendous, and to this day, have a tremendous respect for the Marine infantrymen. Um, those guys are just absolutely amazing. And what they do and how they do it is, is just phenomenal. But um, to Bob's point, they didn't need some uh, green second lieutenant in there out there directing them. I listened to my NCOs and my sergeants um, and anybody with experience could always get my ear and say, hey, Lieutenant, let's not go left. We, I think we ought to go right on this one because they had been there and done that. I, uh, I got to Vandergriff I'm pretty much the same way as everybody else, but the unit I was going to was so far up north that it took about five days for them to get a helicopter that was going that way. So the LZ commander at Vandegriff, or Studded as was it called then, was a, uh, a captain named Gary Dockendorf, who was the OSO in Cincinnati prior to being in Vietnam. So I would run into people all my tour that knew who he was 
because he had uh, convinced them that this was, you know, a glorious way to die. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I also learned how, um, you know, resupply worked, you know, how, the, how they stacked the loads and did all that kind of stuff. And I got to watch helicopters a lot, uh, which had a later, later effect on me. When I got to uh, 1st Battalion, 3rd Marines, um, it was pretty easy to tell where we were. Um, they hadn't bothered to, to uh, dig a latrine because they were using the river that was right near them. And I, you know, not knowing a whole lot, said, say, what's the name of this river? And they said, ah, it's the Benhai River. And I said, isn't that the river? And they said, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we spent a lot of time up there, may maybe another three or four weeks up there. And the one thing I remember from my time in the, in the grunts was, we just walked every day. You know, uh, well, we're here, let's pick up and go there. Um, a couple of things that made it a little easier for me is I, I took my platoon over from a Lance Corporal who'd had it for four, for four months. Wow. Uh, he was from Detroit, I can't remember his name. But uh, after I'd been there not very long, we were gonna cross a big open area. And uh, so I said, all right, we're gonna form everybody up into, into fire teams and we're gonna do fire team rushes across the open area, just like you do in Quantico. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, uh, Lieutenant, get, could you listen to maybe a good idea or just an idea? I said, sure. And he says, the way we do it is we take the first squad and we make them the front, the left hand front half of a D. And we take the second squad and make them the right hand front half of the D. And we take the third squad and make them the back of the D. And everybody faces outboard. And then we all march across the area together. And he says, we've never taken a round doing this. And, uh, and I said, well, sounds like a good idea to me. We'll try it. <laughs> and it worked like a champ. I mean, they Ooh. waited until we were in the tree line on the other side and then they just tried to shoot the shit out of us. But the, they didn't <laughs> touch us while we were in, in the big D. And so I asked them later about that. And I said, you know, where'd you come up with this idea? This is great tactics. And I, he says, oh, it's not my tactics. And I said, well, what, what was it? He says, well, you know, when I was a kid, I watched a lot of 12 o'clock high. And I figured if it worked for all those B-17s to have all that firepower facing outboard, mm -hmm. yeah. um, it would work for us. And he mm -hmm. says it has. Wow. And, mm -hmm. and from that point onward, I mean, anybody who had an idea, at least it got a hearing. Uh, because there were, there were a lot of good ideas from people that knew what they were doing a lot better than me. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, we just patrolled and patrolled and patrolled and patrolled. Um, in... Um, we were up in the up, up in the DMZ for first couple of months, up around that area in the Trace, which was that MacArthur line that ran um, south of the DMZ, but kind of north of Kantian and Jialin. Uh, and then uh, we got called for Operation Taylor Common, which was down in uh, the Quezon Mountains, just west of Anwa, uh, which was totally different. Uh, from what we've been used to, uh, the fact being proved by, you know, about half of my troops got malaria and ended up getting medevaced out because the malaria down south was different than the malaria up north, and we were protected from the up north stuff, but we didn't have any experience with the with the down south stuff. Um, so it was pretty it was pretty interesting, and uh, I finally got medevaced in uh, March. Um, back to the hospital ship and uh, and then to, uh, I was supposed to go to Japan, but it was snowing too hard in Japan, so I ended up going to Guam. <laughs> oh, geez. Which was kind of like going on vacation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I was there for about 60 days and uh, when I came back, General Davis was gone. Um, I had forgotten everything I knew about tanks and I went to uh, Third Platoon Alpha Company and we were up at Kantian. Kantian was the hot spot at that time, too. That was It was, um, yeah, it had, well, lots of people like to shoot it. It was a big target. It was a hill out in the middle of nowhere. And, um, even the, the, you know, the most junior gunner in the NVA could hit that. And that's the thing that I, I think that we all experienced was that we were, we were against NVA, hardcore, well-trained troops. These were not VC guys who farmed during the day and sniped at night. Um, so we were running into what I think was probably a very well-trained enemy, well-equipped, 
and just um, on a mission. They were uh, they were relentless, and they she, lived under Chinese around. there too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Chinese. Yeah. Yep. And when I was at Kantan, the, when you looked east to the South China Sea, um, between Kantan and Jiulin, there was a there was a grid line, fifteen sixteen grid line, where um, our uh, TAOR or whatever they called it, called it back then, and and the adjacent units came together. But you couldn't fire over the line, and they couldn't fire over the line. And so we used to watch the uh, NVA walk down the line, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. pretty much in our uniforms. Yeah. yeah um, I think Pete, Pete, you alluded to it, the 90 day, I mean, the, the time with the grunts. And uh, I always wanted to shine a bright light on the grunts because my experience right from the beginning, you know, America's blessed to have such citizens of such character, you know. These guys, we couldn't rotate them until uh, Expression 24, seven, 362 days. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, some guys would ask, say, Lieutenant, I've had enough, you know, you get me out of here. They only had five days left in the country before their full year, end of their full year tour was up, and you couldn't do it because I never had more than 34, a full complement platoon to be 48, 48 months, a TO platoon. I never had th more 34, and that that's because of the non-battlefield casualties that we got from the, from the jungle environment. They say, uh, you know, war is hell and uh, hazardous combat zone. Uh, that's not even close to what, what, what I experienced in a triple canopy jungle where you had, uh, I mean, the other threats beside the NVA that Pete talked about, very cunning NVA troops. And w all we did is conduct uh, 10 objectives a day and then they would send us more objective by radio and uh, you put the coordinates on the map and hit those objectives and try to get to high ground by night. But the uh, wildlife take a toll. Also the heat, uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. You medevac guys, you got to do it. Call the corpsman over and he checks them out. And the jungle rot was so severe. It took me three months in tanks to clear up my jungle rot. I had right along the uh, knuckles, yeah. both hands, mm -hmm. right to the cortical, white cortical bone. So the corpsman every night I would call which where, wherever our night position was and on any, whatever the hell it was, and you know just call them up. Corman, Corman do some call them over and have them bring the guys in that have have problems. So some guys have jungle rot in their femur and their tibia right to the bone. I mean, you take a flashlight and shine it, you see that white cortical bone, and the Corman I'd say you got to get him out of here. You have you the Corman concur. You know you got to get him out of here in the morning. So you don't want to always call a chopper in because that's your position. 34 guys running around the jungle, and here we are today, you know. And mm -hmm. so, but you're always medevacking guys. Uh, rat bites were severe because the rats, the year before, the guys threw the sea rats all over those mountains. So they're, at night, they, here they come, and they were big rats. <laughs> so I used to take my uh, finally two or three in the morning, checking lines all night, and we would rotate in the CP platoon, CP. They were watch the uh, radio man check the lines, the corpsman check the lines to a guy, platoon sergeant. But finally, like I think for myself, at two or three in the morning, you take that poncho liner and I uh, put my M16, the barrel right by my neck, and you just tighten that poncho liner. I always bring it up above my nose because here come the rats. You can feel them, you just get used to them. They yeah. feel their fur on your nose. They're trying to get the sea rats in your mouth. They're trying to get it. So again, I mean, this, the conditions over there drove you nuts. You couldn't wait. Any enemy that appeared before you was in trouble because you couldn't wait to get oh, yeah. your hands on them. Yeah. But the non-battlefield casualties, God, that was medevacs for those kind of problems. Then you had the wildlife, and I mean, maybe you saw them too, tiger tracks. Yep. So one of our primary missions was uh, they would pull us out of the field where the choppers would come and get us and say, well, we're, now we're going to go assault. Uh, fire support base Argon. Well, this is a mountain 400 meters uh, northwest of Quezon, just at the end of the valley. So we would chop her in, then we'd land navigate to the top of the mountain, then patrol all day and secure it. And then the uh, sky cranes and the Chinooks would bring in the bulldozers and the uh, 105 artillery pieces. They would bring in chainsaws for us, so we would create a, you know, some fields of fire and create the uh, the top of the crest of the mountain for the choppers. 
to come in. So it never stopped then, the patrolling incessant. So it was like two days later, finally, the uh, choppers would bring in the uh, 105 ar artillery pieces and s put them in the pits. And then we would move back down, you know, 75 meters down the, from the top of the crest and then uh, start moving the fields of fire out. But, but at first, the fields of fire, there were none. You just did the 360, the company, Echo uh, Company. Uh, we do our 360 and uh, put your LPs out, 150 meters out, and that thick canopy stuff. And you had to know exactly the coordinate where they were so you could help them if there was trouble. You were getting radio contact or something. But So we did that. That was Fire Support Base Argonne. And I stayed there for two weeks. Uh, saw Tiger Tracks just about every day on squad size patrols and platoon size patrols. Just the tracks down near the stream beds. So that was a stone throw to the DMZ and then 300, 400 meters from Blaos. And then we, we built uh, Fire Support Base Russell. The same thing, you know, mm -hmm. is just assaulting the area, then patrolling incessantly, and then securing the area, and then clearing fields of fire. And it's amazing they had yeah. us doing everything, you know. And so your body, I lost 40 pounds. I don't know about you guys, but I lost 40 pounds in the first month and a half. When I went to the hospital shift, the nurse remarked on the fact that my pack weighed more than I did. <laughs> yeah. And when I got when I got to Vietnam, uh, I'm six foot one and I weighed 175 pounds. So you, um, she said my my pack weighed about 135 and I weighed about 120. Wow. So, but I had everything I needed. Yeah. Um, yeah you learn how to pack. I had a couple of couple of uh, boxes of machine gun ammo and two mortar rounds. Uh, extra radio batteries and you know yeah. just the stuff that he ran and the first uh, week that I was there uh, we had a firefight and I ran out of pistol ammo hmm. so I also had a M16 and a couple bandoliers and, yeah. and I had by that time the time I got medevac I had three pistols because uh, <laughs> and, and two knives and uh, one of the things that happened is when I got to the hospital ship, they said, "Well, give me give me your weapons," and they took two of the pistols and the and the uh, and the rifle, and but they didn't take the knives or the uh, or the pistol I had in a in a shoulder holster uh, inside my flak jacket, and uh, I was sitting there giving my medical history to this brown bar nurse, and uh, she looked at me and evidently saw the pistol and uh, thought that she would disarm me and because uh, I kept it in a shoulder holster close to my body it was like covered with lubra plate and she got a hold and it was loaded and she got a hold of it and uh, pu pulled it out of the of the shoulder holster and then didn't have the hand strength to hang on to this essentially greased pig and it goes flying through the room and and I'm you know ducking and getting out of the way and <laughs> slams into the wall in the corner and just falls down and I just get up and walk over now. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh. Well, you know, Bob was talking about the wildlife. Um, one fire support base, how was that? Um, there was a trail up to the where the gun pits were and the, and the uh, CP was. And after our patrols and stuff in the morning, we go up and we get the night objectives. And the trail was just worn down from guys going back and forth here is getting uh, C rations or mail or whatever we got every fifth or sixth day and I remember going up the trail one day and it was pretty well worn by now and uh, as to Bob's point we cut down all of the, the brush that was real high it was still probably almost waist deep but the trail was pretty well worn and I remember just seeing this huge almost looked like um, well it was a large snake <clears throat> but it was probably the width of a tractor tire <clears throat> just easing across the path going you know 90 degrees different from where I was going but I wasn't gonna I was gonna let him go all the way through and it probably took him about 45 to 50 seconds to get across the path didn't even, didn't see me I just caught him probably in mid mid length but it was um, it you know looked like something out of Jurassic Park it was that big and that slow and I sure didn't want to see the front end of it or the back end of it for that matter but once it got by I just went down the trail got back to my area in the perimeter um, and got in my foxhole and we figured out what we we're going to do that night. And it, 
the whole premise of what we were doing at the time was we were we would take these hilltops, kick the guys off, put in a fire base, yep. and then we would move the fire base and move off, and they would come back, and then so we would come back, exactly. you know, some time later and take the place yeah. back again. Yep. Um, but there was a lot of, I mean, the wildlife was amazing. Yeah. I there was, were four tigers there. Yeah. And uh, when I left Argonne, two weeks later, one four replaced us, you know, uh, on that mountaintop after we created that base. But then a guy was hauled out of the hole and dragged, a tiger tried to drag him across the stream down below and couldn't make it, so it left him, but uh, he was dead. Yeah. So he killed the Marine, and then at Alpine we were getting movement all the time. You know, checking lines, and I don't know you guys, but checking lines, I mean, <laughs> all three squads on your perimeter. Most of, most of the time you were on a, now the company on top of a hill, you were on a platoon size ambush. You know, sometimes I separate my squads and the three separate them. So checking the lines at night with a red lens flashlight. Yeah. You know, the tiger out there, you know. Yeah. So I always had the 45 in my hand. <laughs> I cleaned that thing about three times a day. Yeah. Because one time it froze up on me from the, uh, from the heat, you yeah. know, just the rust. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. And I said, Jesus Christ. So I, I made sure that M16s, but you had to clean them to make sure they were working. And, but checking the lines at night, you know, th between the holes, 30 meters and stuff, walking through the jungle, no field, of fire, nothing. I mean, it, you always had you, you your sprinter wire, your sprinter muscle fired every every second. Yeah. I mean, you were, but I mean, I had so many grenades on me, and but they wouldn't have helped a tiger to be on you in a second. Yeah. Let alone the NVA uh, moving up on top. We were at Camp Carroll, and uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a call from one of the squads, and they said Camp Carroll had communications wire all the way around the perimeter and phones at different locations. I got a call from the squad, and they said, you know, we think that the phone wire is moving out of the perimeter. And we had a starlight scope, so I went down there mm -hmm. and uh, to see where it was, and they said, I said, where do you think it's going? He says, well, if it's moving that way, and we set up the starlight scope and looked out there, and there was <laughs> there was a tiger out there just kind of pulling it in, pulling. <laughs> That's <crazy. laughs> thinking he was going to get somebody on the other end. Yeah, um, that was the first time since uh, basic school that I fired the FPF, and after that there was no tiger. But I'm thinking he may have just run away. But yeah, you could hear him out there chasing oh, those small oh, yeah. rock apes. Yeah, I mean the shrill screaming at night. The jungle just uh, violent out there. I mean, they all the noise, you know, the, unbelievable. So you think of these guys, that's why I'm alluding to the grunts again. I mean, I'm serving that, 90 days, I could hardly do it. Yeah. My body, you know, and uh, old Corman lanced those things every night, and Jesus, and the leeches all over your body. I mean, I mean, I had them on, like, I had it on private parts and everything. <laughs> you just demonstrate the truth how to get them off, yeah. not to use fire on private parts, use salt. You know, yeah, really. yeah, you get a right. kick out of that. Yeah. Right? But and you got to admit that uh, you know it was tactical suicide on those. You're trying to hit ten objectives every day in the Quezon Valley or anywhere around that area, Mutter's Ridge, and you're, you're single column, it's ten meters apart, and the, the guy at the point's got a map. You teach him how to map read. You try to get the guy rotates. You got to teach another guy how to map read. Yeah. And I was always like, I put myself six guys back. And uh, with the map, you know, <coughs> checking all the time is you got to get to that objective before it gets dark. Try to get to it, and um, but you're like, you know referred to it as tactical suicide. You're in, we learned conventional warfare and training in basic school. You know the, the noise discipline. Yeah. But you had none. You just <laughs> here we come. Yeah. Can you hear us? Can you see us? The chopper landing and stuff. Yeah. Here we come after you. We're on the offensive all the time. But geez, all that noise in the machete and triple canopy yeah. takes it a while to cut that bamboo. But all that noise, yeah. and the, the, the NVA just waited for you to come, and, and that's why I got hit first uh, by large. We're in the middle of a bunker complex, but you know when you're checking those sleeves coming down from the mountains. I mean, you can't just leave the sleeves unpatrolled. I mean, you got to get inside those sleeves, and you see your first bunker. And you look at it, you see an edge through the can triple canopy, and you say, oh, we're in trouble. Then you check, you check in the 360, you know, to see if you're in the middle of a bunker complex or just at the edge. 
Right. They can call an artillery, saturate them. But invariably it happened you you were in the middle of a few bunkers, you know, and they waited, just like yes. we would wait. Oh yeah. yeah. For them to get in the kill zone and open up and geez, it's just all hell they talk about. We got uh, we got put in a the forty six has put us in the wrong L Z one day. And um, they were waiting for us and so we were crossing to the other side of the LZ to get go up a finger to go to where we were supposed to go to and uh, they started mortaring this LZ as we, as we were coming across and so we're like booking it across the LZ and um, a mortar round I don't know where it landed but it knocked me forward and I ended up in a in a bomb crater hmm. and uh, if this was a quality control check for my platoon because the first voice I heard was saying the lieutenant's down and uh, then the next voice said, the lieutenant's hit. And I'm laying there in the bottom of the bomb crater trying to collect myself. And then the third voice says, the lieutenant's dead. And I figured, well, I better take a little control of this. So I said, <laughs> no, I'm not. And from all the way on the other side of the LZ, I heard some, this voice go, shit. Jesus. <laughs> 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 uh, well, you showed them. You Jump back up, probably, and That's said, right. get so your asses out of here. Had to do a little more uh, quality control with my <laughs> PR, you know. <laughs> and I didn't recognize the voice, and that really bothered me. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, I got to admit, though, I think, personally, I think we were winning that war my first month and a half or mm -hmm. a little over a month. I mean, being all over the place on a camping trip and not getting, not having any contact with the enemy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, standing yeah. on top of Quezon three times on 881 South North. And those other just you know, in that Quezon Valley and getting intelligence reports. I mean, you see the smoke inside of Laos, and so you knew they were in there, you know, yeah. and that far away. And then you, you were 34 guys or 37 guys, Marines, so at night here on top there, you know, and I would always use H and I harassing interdicting fire, and I'd pull the fire in at night artillery just to surround me in a 360. Yeah. So if I needed it, yeah. you knew you had air five yeah. minutes, you knew you had artillery four different fire bases, so you weren't that worried, but when you get the intelligence reports, you said that there's, I think there were S3 reports, you know, you get 40,000 NVA in Laos there, you know, and you say, oh, wait one, and you say, oh, wow, what the hell did I say? You say, you say 4,000? No, 40,000 NVA just across, so that's how many meters? That's not that far away, you know, yeah. less than a mile. And you can see it, you know, you can see Co Rock down there inside Long Bay, uh -huh. and you can see uh, Laos and see the smoke. So that's the Ho Chi Minh, and they're coming down there, yeah. but they don't want to bother you because they know they get hammered. At the same time, they're not going to fool with 34 guys. Yeah. And that's, yeah. they got their own objectives. But I mean, you talked about a spectre monster firing. I mean, I got to admit, you know, you're at night, you know, and you're on top of those old historic. Uh, I mean, it was just the nine months, six, seven months before that, it was a siege of Quezon. I mean, yep. 245 Marines died and uh, 3,000 rounds a day, and here I am. Here you are with a little platoon on yeah. top of that thing saying, come and get me. And uh, and that was, we were just guinea pigs out there to, to yeah. draw contact. And then, the, you know, they'd bring in the muscle and we'd hammer them. For, yeah. But still, geez, it wasn't very comfortable. And these grunts, they went through a whole year of that stuff. Yeah, I, I just can't imagine 13 months yeah, of doing that. That's why. Um, and then the news media missed a heck of a opportunity to, for finally for a positive news story. I mean, they treated the negative news stories all over oh, Vietnam. Yeah. But geez, they, these grunts they should embed it. I never saw a reporter, but just embed and say, look at these guys, and look look at when they rotated. They spent three months. I mean. Almost twelve months in this crew. Well, our, and they our, came back. Yeah, and they they yeah. would they would they would they extend. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unbelievable. I mean, America's extended. blessed to have such people. Uh, yeah. Jesus. And 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 I you know I think that General Davis probably had a had a fairly good handle on what he was trying to do when he put us out there for ninety days, because I I was out there for a lot longer than ninety days, and the attachment that you get to your platoon is bad enough at 90 days. Yeah. yeah. But, oh, yeah. you know, after I'd been out there as long as I was, I mean, yeah. you could, I, I got medevac because I had 
jungle rot, like like you said, and it was to the bone on one leg. And the company yeah. commander told me, "You're not allowed to go to war with a crutch anymore. You have, <laughs> to, <laughs> you have to get on. The, you have to get on the bird." <laughs> wow, God. Because I hated the medevac because one more man down, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. You only had 33, then 29. You say, "Wow." Get a couple of the missions, and they still you gotta get it stiffen up your spine and take it. But still, those medevacs, you had to get them out of there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I think the takeaway from from our session, at least for me, was that uh, we had all of this training and tracked vehicles. Found out that we we're going to be with an infantry unit. Uh, of course, you can't say no to the order, but you went out and did it, and the respect that you you gained and those guys earned. Uh, in the infantry is just something that, that I marveled at. And, and any time when I was in tanks that I had grunts on board or could carry some extra sea rats or something like that, yeah. we sure did it because those guys were out there in the thick of it day in and day out. And I think to both Bob and John's points, um, you know, we were the bait. You put, send a patrol out there and to find out what the bad guys are. Well, you know, the first guys going in are the infantry guys. Yeah. Yeah, early on, the defensive position of the Marines, Marines aren't meant to be defensive. Military, you know, we're supposed to be on the offensive, but sitting that case out or conked in, getting artillery barrages for six months, for three months or so. So then they went into the June of '68. I think they reverted to the heel lift assault. Yeah. Anywhere right. intelligence picked up, even the smell of an enemy where they might be, you know, congregating. Yeah, right. Then they put us on the choppers and hit the area. And my first nine assaults in, in, in October and early November, and there's no contact at all, none. I mean, you just hit the mountaintop, you know, and the area. I mean, there would be a lot of choppers on either side. You look out the window, the artillery slamming in front of you, you say, oh, this is going to be it, and there's no contact. Uh -huh. But then I finally had contact on my 10th assault at uh, Mudders Ridge. And uh, yeah, then I did have a successful ambush, a Y-shaped ambush. We learned in, in, in remember in training, mm -hmm. Y-shaped ambush? Yeah. So I caught him at night coming down, filtering down through on the Camlo River. You know where that yeah, is? Yeah, yeah. So like 2 o'clock in the morning, the bright moon, yeah. I, uh, and we got even with him. When I, when I was in high school, I had this really terrifying Latin teacher. And my junior year, everybody had like whatever was going around. And there was usually 16 of us in the class, and I was the only one. Hmm. And this guy like focused in on me. We talked to um, him. The way he was teaching me to read Latin is we read Caesar's Gallic Wars, mm -hmm. and he talked about the tenth. They talked about the tenth legion, which was their best um, legion. And one of the things that they did is, well, two things they did is they always dug in when they stopped, and at night um, they would set up, and as soon as it got dark, they would move. Yeah, not very mm -hmm. far, but they would move. And I I kept that in in the back of my brain bucket because. Um, my company commander was a uh, Charlie company. It was a guy named George Kiesel, and uh, he decided that I should be the night guy. And we started going out at night. And uh, and uh, he was from Long Island, so he had this rather strange accent. And after we'd been out like six or seven nights, he started calling me the Panther. But it sounded like he was saying Panther, P A N T H A, and. Uh, <laughs> So we started doing that. We went out for about a month and a half every night, and we got pretty uh, pretty good at doing it. Yeah. Um, but and w and we got pretty good at avoiding them finding us at night. So. But Johnson stopped that bombing on November first, nineteen sixty-eight. Yep. And that's where the yeah. FDA started coming well, across really the DMZ again. Oh yeah. With their headlights on. Yeah. Yeah. Geez. So that, that <coughs> some of them decided they didn't want to win the war, It'd just be a holding action, and eventually turn it over to the. Uh, the uh, South Vietnamese Army, you know, Arvins. Yep. But uh, you could see it happening, you know. But can you imagine being out there and all over the damn area and not having any contact? I mean, yeah. I don't yeah. believe my first month and a half was unbelievable. But then it got more exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he stopped that bombing. I mean, I had a, the th two things that I took with me that into country is they gave us these cards at basic school on how to call in fire and mm -hmm. how to call in artillery, and I had them laminated. I still got them in uh, case uh, we need to call in any fire in Virginia. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> there's, but, a, there's a little white house down the road that you Yeah. 
But I, I, like, you know. I like an expression fire for effect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I fired in New Jersey once and, and, oh, yeah. and uh, fired, asked them to fire for effect, and they called me back and said we did. <laughs> check, check the altitude Ooh. on the target. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, it got to the point where you had to simplify, and that was a pretty simple system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, okay. I can remember calling, calling the desk and saying, I'd like a $200,000 airstrike. Then they would send four A4s. Yeah. And so wow. it just worked out real well. Yeah. And and when we were out at night, they gave us uh, this yellow box. It was a ramp fact beacon where you could offset targets yeah. and call in A6s at night, which really surprised everybody. Yeah, they didn't expect it. intruder. Yeah. 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 And then wow. you, would, you would put in the put in your position, and then you would give them a direction and a, yeah. or azimuth and, a, and an altitude for the what you wanted taken out, and as soon as you heard them, you would start saying offset, so that they would remember they're not bombing the box, they're bombing the, the target. Yeah. But we never even got close to getting hit with that. But yeah. How about uh, spooky? Oh, yeah. Puff the magic. Oh, yeah, puff. Yeah. Boy, that thing was ominous. That's why you felt so safe over there, I mean. Yeah, you... You knew you'd call in the air artillery and then spooky up there. If you, if you had basketball, you could write letters. Yeah. yeah. It was bright enough. Yeah. I know, it's unbelievable. I used to, uh, if I caught any movement or any other thing, I'd call something in. Yeah, it was it was so available, yeah. and boy, it was much easier than walking into something. Yeah. You know, so you so you blow up a little of a hillside, and then you go, you don't find anything. But strangely, in the jungle warfare, I mean, you get guys missing, you know, and a couple of guys missing, and until you, and then we had we had a problem over there after the bombing stopped. That uh, you know, there, there was a few different problems. You you see that not support you know I only had three radios supposed to have four mm -hmm. and I asked you know for a month and a half I mean pressing them okay, I, gotta, I gotta have another radio you know there's a squad without a radio I needed mine but uh, and then the M16s jamming up I mean I used a, a, a pump shotgun in Remington you know with a bandolier 80 buckshot I mean that a gunny rotating gave me mm -hmm. because the M16s were really jamming up yeah and uh, then I used a blooper. I got pretty comfortable with the M7 Hillary blooper. Yeah. And then with a the big bandolier, I yeah. think it was 180 rounds of that around my neck. So, uh, and we didn't have any PC rolls over there at the time. You know, you kind of contact, you're walking along a trail, and all of a sudden there are rice pots steaming, boiling rice. Yeah. And you knew you were going to have contact. You just call back to the company commander, you know. And I went through five COs. I don't know about you, but never really got to know any company commander over there. And never was debriefed about anything. Yeah. That's one of my problems. You never got to talk about anything. Like, how, how did you screw this up in front? Yeah. Or, oh, Jesus, <laughs> how'd you do this? You know, very successful. I, would, I wanna, nobody ever said anything. You never got debriefed. Yeah. Mainly because of the turnover rotation. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, used to, we used to see the CO generally every night, like two in the morning, because he would bring, us, bring all the platoon commanders in. Yeah. To get the frag order for the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. And uh, when we when we talked to them, but they, you know, I'm not sure they knew much more than we do. No, we yeah. had so much autonomy, but I mean, there was no reading somebody their rights if you contacted the enemy, or if you wanted, like you said, fire, you get yeah. it. Yeah. Just get on that radio, and I always gave them. I said, my last coordinate. <coughs> can you provide that to Russell and Alpine, the other fire bases? So if you needed, they just. Immediately, yeah. You just call them up and say, "On oh, my last fire, perfect." Yeah. Then the stuff pours in. We used to um, do. You probably did the same thing. We we had checkpoints that we were supposed to hit. Yes, checkpoints. And and mm -hmm. you know they were really good to adjust artillery from if you yes. were sure you were where you were. Exactly. I you know I like Pete. I wasn't the world's most superb map reader either. Neither <laughs> yeah. was I, but I. I believe you got to believe in that map and that yeah. triple oh, canopy. Yeah. And because I was caught in the DMZ a couple of times. Uh, well, I had objectives that were in for it on the DMZ, big mountains. And uh, it get too dark, or you, you tried to late afternoon, you know, you yeah, still get reached by objective, you call back, say, yeah, I can still <coughs> get that objective. You start climbing the other mountain, you say, geez, the troops are worn out, the guys are worn out. You got to get back to the top of the other, like Mutter's Ridge, get back to yeah. the ridge line. And you say, I can't take it till tomorrow. Okay, you know. <clears throat> but uh, a couple times in the Z, and you get messed up. 
in the, in the map, but you turn around, you just orient it to true north, and the compass, you know, and then they point it back to, I mean, you orient the map to the Indians, just take a heading and you gotta follow that damn. Yeah. Or you could get them to fire Willie P for you. Yeah, that's another, yeah. yeah Willie yeah. Pete Airburst, and yeah. Yeah. yeah, I am where I think I am. There it is. Yeah. Well, the thing that I found out well after the fact is the maps we were given were old French maps yeah. that were about 40 years old. Yeah, so a lot of the stuff that was on there yeah. either wasn't there anymore. And a lot of the villages had been emptied. I think yeah. the whole i area, they yeah. basically evacuated. Except for Cam Lowe, that's the only village yeah. I saw within any yeah. Yeah. horse quaint tree city in Dong Ha. But up in everything north of Route 9 uh, was basically nobody there. And if anybody was there, they were the wrong people. They shouldn't yeah. be there. <laughs> they shouldn't so, be there. So we tried to get them out of there. but. Um, the maps that, that I found out after the fact were not real relevant or, or you know, at least older than, uh, than, I think they went back to the French. Yeah. Um, and they got them from Shell. And they got, <laughs> yeah. You gotta admit though, I mean, I relied on the maps that got me there, and, but I was checking all the time. Oh yeah. Oh, you and had half to. the time I was walking point because the guy you didn't, I knew guy rotations. Yeah. And uh, you just, you, you're leading us in the wrong direction. And, yeah, you don't want to get lost. That's for but days. it's so thick in that canopy, that yeah. especially bamboo canopy. There's big, uh, you ever see the big bamboo spiders? I mean, the size of my hand, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the other thing is you have to remember that you're traveling essentially with a, a group of little boys. We stopped in a place in the middle of the jungle, and they started bringing me these, like, snakes about that long, bright green. Yeah. And I said, don't touch those. They're bamboo, yeah. they're bamboo vipers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they said, well, should we drop a grenade in the nest? And I said, no. Yeah. <laughs> Just <laughs> get away. Leave them alone. It's funny, I never saw a snake, but when you laid your head down at night, you know, I mean, it was just in the bush, you know, and you always... Oh, God. You always wondered. Uh, I mean, I had centipedes and stuff. They, they were sometimes that long, of, almost a foot long. They were supposed to be medevac if you got... And I remember taking the K-bar on two different occasions and just slicing the thing up because it's so close to my head all night, I guess. Yeah. But it's just a creepy crawl. The rats, you're concentrating on the rats on your chest, you know. You, you, you can't move up because you're a mummy inside yeah. that bag. Yeah. And it's just, you got to get some sleep. And, uh, you know, I years and years later, I saw that, one, saw that movie, Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. And Tom Hanks is essentially, he's a platoon commander as a captain. Yeah. And, uh, through the whole movie, I couldn't uh, couldn't figure out why I was identifying so strongly with him, and then I realized through the whole, mo whole movie, you never see him sleep. Yeah. And that was pretty much was what pretty I remember from being a, an infantry platoon commander. Sleep like, deprivation. Yeah, yeah. I, I might have slept one or two hours a night, you know, but it yeah. was kind of catch us. I was using that starlight all night long. Oh, yeah. Because the green powdery haze, I think it was 100 meters, 75 meters. Yeah. But it was snowy, hay, green haze, and uh, you could pick up movement, you know. You, yeah. Because I got Russell, you know, after I left, you know, to come go into tanks, uh, the guy that replaced me was killed within a month. I mean, that Russell happened right the, the next month, and it was a con condition red, and they overran the mountain. But I, I, I could tell something was going on because I was a fresh mountain. Right. We built a fire base, and it was <coughs> moving the field fires, field of fire away. And but at night, I mean, the tiger, the noise, the stuff going on, but hitting those lines and l l trying to listen. It was so much, not jungle, so noisy. But I, th I picked up movement, you know, but you can't fire around. The LPs would want to fire around or fire a burst right. or throw grenades, you know, you can't give away your position. You just hold, you know, and make sure both of you are awake all night. And uh, you got movement, you got contact, and you just got to wait, you know, and because you don't want to give away your position. But it'd be a tough call because of the but I'd be seeing movement, you'd want to tell them, you know, to always two guys on. I mean, usually one guy on, one guy off. Yeah. That's why you talk about females, you know, it might be tough oh. out there on those LPs. 150 <laughs> meters out of the line, you know, in Myers Ridge. Yeah. And you're yeah. saying no funny stuff out there, no, no, con <laughs> no contact. contact with well, you know, I th you were talking before about using a, a, a blooper. Yeah. And I, carried a blooper a lot and and generally it was because at night if I had to I could mm -hmm. I could provide artillery to my LPs because I could shoot right over their head yeah yeah I was pretty accurate that did 
Okay. Well, guys, we're probably getting close to closure time. It's 10 o'clock. Right actually. on it. Uh, I want to thank Bob and John very much for participating in this. Um, and when we first sent out the email saying anybody spent, had the experience of 90 days as a grunt, um, both Bob and John came back to me immediately and said, man, we, we've got some stories to tell. And we didn't know anybody was as unlucky as we were to be assigned <laughs> from, uh, from our MOS. Well, we knew Fuller. That's right. Yeah, Hank, Fuller. Hank Fuller. So there's the four of us. I have gotten emails from some other guys, a couple of lawyers. Can you imagine a lawyer grunt uh, platoon commander? That's a little scary. Um, but a couple of lawyers spent their first 90 days. Um, so we really appreciate it. And this, uh, this video will be part of the history project. And I thank these guys for their service and their support and all the fun we had in, in OCS, basic school, Vietnam, track vehicle school, and at all the reunions. It's yeah, been thank great. Thank you guys for your service and welcome home. Yeah. Exactly. And it kind of, kind of ends up it's, well, here we are, headed to LAX with a case of beer. Yeah. <laughs> That's a true story. That's another story for another video.